Coming up on this edition of the Center of It All. We visit the dogs of Nittany Beagle Rescue. We have details on the public art walk in downtown State College. And Andrew Callista visits the Penn State Car Club. These stories and more coming up next on the Center of It All. Hello and welcome to the center of it all. I'm back in downtown State College checking out the public art. And for more information on these works, I sat down with the executive director of the Central PA Festival of the Arts, Rick Bryant. Walk the streets of downtown State College and you won't just find restaurants and shops. Tucked away on side streets and alleyways, you'll find remarkable works of art. The Public Art Committee, in collaboration with the Central PA Festival of the Arts, the Downtown Improvement District, CityStarts.com, and State College residents put together a brochure showcasing 25 spots downtown. Just through sitting around the conference table several times, we decided to put together this brochure and art tour. So it really is the work of a lot of people. Local and nationally recognized artists over the years have displayed their works of art here in State College. Many of them are of national stature. Uh, the one thing that they do have in the works have in common is they're all uh, viewing them as all free and accessible to the public. But you can see a wide variety of work by people who are exceptionally talented. There is over a century of time between the oldest piece of art and the newest. The oldest piece is Centennial Fountain. It's uh, in Sydney Friedman Park and it looks sort of like a horse trough. The newest piece is the downtown Eugene Brown sculpture, which is in front of Sklo Center Region Library and the Cata Stop here on Beaver Avenue. So, you know, they, the works, there are 107 years between the oldest and the newest, which is really quite remarkable. The Centennial Fountain is an iron drinking fountain, which once was an oasis for people on horseback. And the newest piece of art, downtown Eugene Brown, comes equipped with headphones and a tablet. Well, I gotta admit, I really like downtown Eugene Brown. You know, the Arts Festival helped make that project happen, and so I sort of have a soft spot for him. I think it's great that he does have a tablet and he has, still has a book in his pocket. I love seeing the people at the uh, local whiskey bar across the street, like, talk about him and take their selfies with him, and, you know, I think that's pretty cool. But by the same token, you know, I do love the windows at St. Andrews. They're like what church windows should be to somebody my age, so. I, you know, there's a wide variety, and I guess I'd sort of say, uh, you know, they're like kids. I kind of love them all. There are murals around town depicting the past, present, and future of State College. Some are even unfinished. The uh, murals on uh, Heister Street especially, they are an ongoing process, which is sort of neat. You can see a, a work of art in progress. Inspiration State College is a pretty popular spot on the Art Walk. Portraits in the mural continue to change with the events in State College. We think it is an attraction. It will be more of an attraction. You know, different pieces of art have different levels of engagement. I mean, if I had a dollar for every person who took their picture at the Nittany Lion, you know, I would be living in Palm Beach right now. So we're hoping that this brochure will uh, enable people to engage with more of the works than just the sort of obvious ones. Speaking of that infamous lion, the Public Arts Committee hopes to further the tour on campus. Expanding the project to include the art on the Penn State campus. Right now it's not included and it's, you know, an obvious omission, but we did talk about it and that was just a little beyond our capacity today. The walking tour is about showcasing and preserving the art in downtown. Adding public art to downtown State College, it's a, it really separates our town from a lot of places. You know, I, I don't expect everybody to get the chills you get when you go into the Lincoln Memorial and you see that giant statue of Abraham Lincoln. But you know, a flutter? Yeah, I'd, I'd buy that. That's a good thing. There are 25 different stops on the walk and you can find a full map and information at statecollegepublicart.com. If you happen to be in the downtown, take some time to check out some of these amazing murals. Now when we come back on the center of it all, we're hanging out with some boisterous beagles. Welcome back to the center of it all. Are you looking for a loving, playful companion? Well, forget the dating sites and check out Nittany Beagle Rescue for a small breed ready to sniff their way into your home. 
An all-volunteer organization, Nittany Beagle, is a foster-based adoption rescue in central Pennsylvania that works with shelters in the area and even out of state to find perfect loving homes for our four-legged friends. People contact us or, or shelters contact us in terms of taking in dogs. Um, and so if an owner can't keep their dog and their beagle or beagle mix any longer, um, or if a shelter is running out of space or if the dog may have some medical issues that we can help with, um, then that's how we get our dogs. Everybody steps forward for something and this is where the volunteers at Nittany Beagle Rescue, this is one area in which we're all stepping forward and doing what we can to help. Community members around Central PA, like Lions Kennels in Zion, assist Nittany Beagle by taking in strays awaiting adoption, while area vets aid in cutting the pricey medical bills for the pups. And while the help and donations are appreciated, much more is needed. We really, really need volunteers to help walk the dogs out that stay out here. We also, we do showings at PECO, and so we need volunteers to help to, to help transport the dogs, basically, that are art lions to PECO and, and hold the leash, just be the dog's ambassador, and then take them back. Skeptical about your ability to handle a beagle, fostering on a trial basis is an option, and according to Kathy, most times you won't want to let go. A foster home provides a temporary home for the dog. Nittany Beagle Rescue will pay for all the medical care, we'll supply the food if needed. I mean, we'll supply everything. Um, a lot of our foster homes end up adopting their dogs. Beagles are perfect for young and active people. Take Lily here, a spunky and excitable tricolor with that classic Beagle Bay. She loves being around children and to go for runs with her owners, as long as she's on a leash. While May, a five-year-old former stray, just wants to lay around on a nice couch and is perfect for the person looking to curl up with a companion. And have no fear, these dogs love living inside. We have taken dogs in that have lived outside their entire life in these, you know, these cages, you know. And, uh, and people say, oh, they're an outdoor dog, they're a honey dog, you know, you can't make them a house dog. And, and these dogs, they want to live with the family. They want to be with people. And they're actually easier to house train than, than a puppy. A screening process ensure the beagles find a loving home. Not meant to scare anyone from adopting, rather a check to make sure the person is ready for the commitment. Jumping off is the hardest part, but if you are interested, check out Nittany Beagle on their website and Facebook pages, or head over to the State College Petco twice a month for some personal interaction. There's so much need. You know, it, it, that's it, it, I mean, these dogs need a home. If somebody has to, um, ha has to do something, has to speak for them, has to, so, somebody has to look out for them and do, and do what we can. And, and I wish we could do more. You want to stop? In need of a cuddle buddy? Check out Nittany Beagle Rescue. It just might be the missing part in your life. Andrew Callista for the center of it all. Say bye, May. Say bye. You can meet the Beagles in person on Saturdays at Petco. Now Andrew Callista stopped by the Penn State Car Club picnic for some fast cars and some good times. We all have our hobbies. Baseball, golf, computers. One hobby growing on the main campus is the Penn State Car Club, where enthusiasts can gather, learn, and yes, of course, work on their ride. Uh, you don't even have to have a car to join. Uh, if you have a love or a passion for cars, you can be involved. Um, we have plenty of people and kids uh, with older muscle cars, imports, domestics, everything. While we all can't be driving around in Maseratis, it's good to know that even my wheels could make the cut. The coolest thing about the car club is getting to share your knowledge and experience with your peers, which makes attracting new members a top priority. Oh, it's always great when we get a new member that's very passionate about the club. Um, it, it helps feed our club and make it bigger and grow. Uh, as the years go on, we always look for you know, the, the younger kids and everything to keep the club going. We want to make sure that it uh, gets bigger over the years as well. Growing the club means you have to have car shows, meetings, 
cookouts, and yes, fundraising. And after being officially recognized by the university, it's fun to look back and see how far the club has come. I mean, when we started, we were 14 kids standing, you know, we were getting kicked out of every parking lot for loitering. And now we have uh, about 2,800 members spanning over eight campuses. We have about 280 just here at Penn State. Um, and just to see the growth of it, to go up the chain of command, up the positions and everything, and, and really get to see this grow has been the biggest experience and greatest experience for me. Um, also getting involved in Thawne, making sure that we uh, did a great thing there as well. We had a nice big car show, but it was beneficial for something. For more information on the Penn State Car Club, check them out on their Facebook page. Andrew Callista for the center of it all. If you're into cars, mark your calendars for July 18th. WHBL will be hosting a Christmas in July car cruise benefiting the Center County Toys for Tots. For more information, visit our website. And when we come back, Mel is cooking up another delicious meal. Welcome back. Memorial Day is the kickoff to the cookout season. And on this edition of Kitchen Encounters, Mel is serving up her twist on chicken salad. Perfect for your next get together. Everybody likes chicken salad, or at least I think they do. Every chef or cook I know has one or two favorite recipes in their repertoire. Today, I'm gonna show you how to make a light, refreshing Asian chicken salad, perfect for any summer gathering. Let's get started. The first thing we're going to do today is make our dressing. And we're making this first because I'm going to use it as a marinade for my chicken too. In this nice little container, I've put a half a cup of vegetable oil and a half a cup of rice vinegar. And rice vinegar is an inexpensive ingredient you can find at your Asian market, but it's much milder in flavor than white vinegar. I highly recommend you pick up a bottle of that and keep it in your pantry. There's a quarter cup of honey in here, and now I'm going to add two tablespoons of soy sauce and two tablespoons of sesame oil. I'm going to put a nice tight fitting lid on this. Give it a good shake. Set it aside. Our dressing's done. How easy was that? Now I'm going to give you my two cents about chicken. It's versatile, affordable, and I love it. But I rarely use leftover chicken to make chicken salad. Why? Because I want my chicken to be flavored with the proper herbs and spices, those that go with the chicken salad I'm making. Last year, I showed you how to make roasted chicken Caesar salad, and we roasted chicken breasts to go specifically into that salad. Today, I'm going to show you how to infuse authentic Asian flavors into this easy oven poached chicken breast. I've put three sliced scallions on a 12 inch piece of aluminum foil, and I'm going to sprinkle about a quarter to a half teaspoon of ground ginger over the top taking an entire chicken breast that I've sliced in half and I'm putting that right on top of the aluminum foil and I'm going to drizzle it which, with our salad dressing which is now being used as our marinade about a tablespoon over each half I'm going to seal up this packet and I'm placing it on a baking pan with a second chicken breast. We'll, you'll need two whole chicken breasts to make this recipe. All I'm gonna do now is put this in a 350 degree oven for one hour. Let's talk noodles. Back in 1986, my husband and I spent a week in Tokyo. Besides a bunch of sightseeing, I learned to love eating marinated fish salad for breakfast, Kobe beef for dinner, and soba noodles for lunch. When I came back to the States, the first thing I wanted to do was introduce my kids to some Japanese flavors, and I thought soba would be the way to go. I love soba. My kids, not so much. It's made from buckwheat, it has a coarser texture, and it's kind of salty. 
Then one afternoon, it occurred to me, it's cooked identical to spaghetti. When I made that substitution, mom's spaghetti chicken salad was born. The only thing you have to do with one pound of spaghetti is cook it according to the directions, rinse it thoroughly in cold water, and drain it, but draining isn't enough. What we have to do is put it on a pan to actually dry, and I don't mean dried out. Why? Because the oil in our vinaigrette will not stick to wet pasta. Every salad needs some crunch, and typically Asian salads aren't served with bread or croutons. They're garnished with nuts or seeds. And I'm garnishing my salad today with sesame seeds, but I'm gonna show you one of my family's favorite little snacks, super easy to make, that is perfect with Asian fare. Honey sesame pita crisps. I've cut one loaf of pita pocket bread in half around the outside and opened it up like a book. I've put some softened butter on it, about a teaspoon and a half, and about the same amount of honey, a teaspoon and a half. Just gonna quickly spread it over the top. A light sprinkling of sesame seeds. Cut this into six or eight wedges. Nice big sharp knife. I'm gonna arrange these side by side on a rack in a baking pan. Make sure you have a rack in your pan. And now I'm gonna put these under the broiler for exactly three minutes. How easy is that? Putting this Asian chicken salad together couldn't be easier. I put my pasta in a nice big bowl and I've tossed it with about a quarter cup of my honey sesame salad dressing just to loosen it up and make sure it's evenly coated. Now I'm gonna add all of that cooled and roasted chicken, which is full of Asian flavor, which I've shredded it about three to four cups. I'm going to add three to four cups of broccoli florets raw. You don't wanna blanch them for this salad. It's gonna give some great crunch and texture a cup of green onion, scallion. We're adding scallions, not any other kind of onion, because that's the kind of onion we put underneath our chicken when it cooked. And I'm adding a cup of diced red bell pepper. If you're not a red bell pepper fan, try some shredded matchstick carrots in its place. I'm gonna give it a quick toss now. And next, I'm going to add about a tablespoon of toasted sesame seeds and another half of this dressing. And what's going to happen, you might have a little left at the end, but I don't add it all at once. You just want to toss until all of the ingredients are coated and nothing, no dressing or marinade is, is puddling in the bottom of the bowl. This smells wonderful, and it looks lovely. And I think that's enough dressing for today. The next time you're asked to bring a salad to a summertime gathering, think light, refreshing, and Asian. For these and all of my recipes, just go to my website. There's nothing like a fresh salad on a warm spring day. Now when we come back, if you don't have plans for Memorial Day yet, we have a few things happening in your area. Welcome back. May is Skin Cancer Awareness Month and we have the details from the doctors at the Cleveland Clinic on how to protect your skin from the sun. Melanoma is a deadly form of skin cancer and one of the fastest growing cancers in the U.S. Dr. Brian Gassman treats melanoma at the Cleveland Clinic. He says anyone can get melanoma, so it's critical to protect your skin from the sun. 
especially when you're young. I would akin it to letting your kids smoke at the age of, in the eighth grade. And if you wouldn't let your kids smoke in eighth grade, you should be just as careful about their sun exposure as well. If you or your children go tanning, it's important to stop. Research shows that indoor tanning increases melanoma risk. If you've had bad sunburns, you're at an increased risk for melanoma as well. People who have fair skin, hair, and eyes are also at higher risk for melanoma. Having more than 50 moles, large moles, or strange looking moles are also risk factors. Protecting your skin from the sun's rays is key in preventing all forms of skin cancer. You can wear tightly woven clothing, a wide brimmed hat, and seek shade. Experts recommend applying sunscreen with a sun protection factor or SPF of 30 or higher to your exposed skin, especially for children. Bad sunburns as a child may increase the risk of melanoma. One study finds melanoma in children increased by an average of 2% between 1973 and 2009, and higher rates were seen in teen girls. Dr. Gassman says this group is of particular concern. Young women are very uh, predispositioned for skin damage because of all the sun exposure, and as much as it may beautify their skin, the ramifications for their long-term life are not worth it. Skin cancers that are caught early are often easily treated. So if you have a mole that has changed, is new, or notice a growth or sore that doesn't heal, Dr. Gassman recommends having it checked out by a doctor as soon as possible. Recently, the stations of Mifflin County Communications received awards for their promotion of blood drives in the Allegheny region. Media award goes to Mifflin County Communications, WCXH 105.5 FM, WKBA 9.20 AM, WVNW 96.7 FM. The team of Midland County Communications has consistently stepped up their efforts to spread the message about the importance of blood donation. Memorial Day is right around the corner, and this is what's happening in our area. Well, that's all for this edition of The Center of It All. For more great WHVL content, log on to our YouTube page, like us on Facebook, and be sure to follow me on Twitter. Thanks for watching and have a great week.